if, yeah. Now, you think, that's ridiculous. Watch people going through, through rehab and tell them it's ridiculous. It's not. They have to go through a lot of work to get these abilities back that, you, that are so transparent to you, ineffable to you. So you're experiencing this largely in an ineffable fashion. That's why it seems so profound and mysterious to you. And phenomenologically it is. And that's why we often use poetry and metaphor to try and talk about it. We try and, in order to trigger it, in order to enhance it. Because we can't directly talk about it and trigger it. We have to do it indirectly because it's procedural. But none of that means we can't study it scientifically, understand it scientifically, and improve it and facilitate it scientifically. And that sounds like a good way to end. So I'll end it. Hello. Where does morality fit, in, uh, fit into your model? Okay, that's a, I think that's a very uh, important question. And um, <coughs> I think one of the things I, I didn't say very much about this is I think that morality relates in some sense, like I suggested in here, to sort of how we fundamentally value things. And uh, one of the arguments I would make is that although this doesn't dictate any particular uh, morality, uh, what it does is it facilitates your ability to render things intelligible. Intelligibility means that you can make sense of them. And one of the things I would suggest to you is that uh, your sense of intelligibility is your primary sense of the realness of things. And one of the interesting things we've sort of known since Plato is that um, more, underneath a lot of our normative claims, a, a lot of our ability to normatively value things as true or good or beautiful, lies this fundamental ability to sense that things are real. So if I put you into this thought experiment, and I've done, I do this usually with some of my students, uh, so, so um, you go, uh, let's say you're one of my 21-year-old students, you go home and your parents say to you, look, we have to explain something to you. And they take you and they take you into the secret room that you never knew existed in the house. And there's all these films and files. I'm getting to a point, just be patient. Right? And what they say is, look, uh, we have actually been hired by the government to raise you. This is all part of an experiment. Uh, we don't actually care for you at all. Uh, we've been paid to say and do all these things. Um, and what we want to tell you is, we're going to continue to say and do everything. We're going to continue to say that we love you and provide for you. But this is all a sham because it's... And when I ask most students, well, how do you now feel about your life? Because none of the facts change. Everybody's going to do what they're always going to do. And they say it's a disaster. Because it's, and the, 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 what they overwhelmingly say, well, it's not real to me anymore. The idea behind this is that you don't have, right, sort of a, a fundamental sense of the realness of things. It undercuts all your, other, uh, all your other values. And one of the things that Plato suggested is that our normativity may actually ground out in this sense of how real things are for us. And that if our morality or our moral practices are taking us too far away from that or disturbing us too much, we start to call them into question. So I don't know, I can't say that this specifies any morality, but what I can say is that morality, I think, deeply presupposes this ability. Even also the development of the concept of right and wrong? Now, that's a different thing. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I think that right and wrong are, are parasitic on your ability to distinguish reality from appearance. I wouldn't identify them, okay? And this is very much a developmental model. This system bootstraps itself up. So I'm not, a, I'm not identifying right and wrong with real and not real, real and appearance, right? The, the reality appearance distinction, but I think if you don't have an appearance reality distinction, you're not going to be able to do right and wrong. So that's how I would answer that. Thanks for a riveting talk. Um, um, you're welcome. I hope my question doesn't reveal that I missed your overall point, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that would be bad for me, too. <laughs> uh, I, I took, I took uh, spirituality to mean that one has a deep belief mm -hmm. um, that by better knowing the essence of themselves, they have... Um, a better um, knowledge of the essence of all beings within their class, like all humans, if they believe that those are the beings in the class, or maybe other animals, or whatever. And that provides a very uh, strong rationale for morality, the golden rule, etc. So the, the issue to me, the problem for me was uh, that if you accept, uh, take a religious view where there's a god or something, in the, sure. the like, then it follows that 
you know, God made you the way you are, as well as all beings in your class, and you have the essential thing apparatus, which is the same. Whereas if you take a secular approach, then that leads to a sense of doubt as to whether this is really true. And the reason there would be doubt is because um, you don't really have proof that you are essentially the same as all other beings. So you have to just look for evidence. But evidence is always fraught with, you know, there's always a sense of doubt when you're looking at evidence. So I'm just wondering whether this framing of spirituality relates to the way you've posed it. Okay, well, there's a couple issues there. First of all, you were talking about, I think, something like a mind sight ability. And um, you were indicating that you thought that spirituality required sort of a belief in that. I don't know if that's true, because again, the anthropological evidence seems to indicate that a lot of people have this experience without even having our concept of belief. Okay. Now, do they have this sense of connectedness, of communicat? Yes, I think. So I would, I would replace maybe belief with sense. And then I would say, I did talk about it in this. Now, the idea that um, uh, there's no good reason for believing this, I, I, I sort of reject that. Uh, because I think we have a lot of good empirical evidence, as I presented, that we actually are, our, our development as an individual mind is coupled and dependent on our relating to other minds. So the sort of Cartesian assumption that we start knowing our own mind and then work our way out and we have to sort of reason our way out to other minds, that's been almost completely undermined by cognitive and neuroscience. It's just, that's just not true. Okay, we develop almost completely in, like it, it's, it, it's reversed. In fact, you, you typically can't get children even to introspect until they've mastered mind sight and language. In fact, I stored as one of my cherished memories the first moment when Spencer, my youngest son, reported introspecting. We were driving down the road and he said, Daddy, it's snowing in my head. And it wasn't actually snowing outside. And this was a revelation to him. He still, he's five and a half, he still isn't at the point where he understands that he can introspect whenever he wants. It still sort of flashes on him. But, man, is he constantly tracking everybody else's mental state all the time. Doing it very, very well. He knows how to manipulate his mom and dad very well. <laughs> so, I think, in one sense, you and I were saying the same thing. I, I resist the use of belief. I think sense, right? And maybe the older meaning of faith as this sense of connection is, is better than a belief-based orientation. And I think there's very good evidence, uh, really good scientific evidence, that uh, we do develop... Um, deeply in connection with other people. And that, in fact, it's increasingly clear that we're wired for distributed cognition. Look, most of our best, sorry, this is long, uh, most of our best problem-solving abilities don't come from individual cognition. How many of you have taken an airplane? Individual, a, a single person can't build an airplane, can't run an airline. We saw a single person can't do science. You just can't do it. We, some of our most powerful ways of realizing relevance is by linking minds together in distributed cognition. We're wired for that. As individual animals, we're pathetic. We, we teeter around on two feet. We expose all of our vital organs. Everybody can see us from a long distance. It's like, hey, come and get, look at my fierce claws. <laughs> right? Our power, like you get a bunch of us together with some pointy sticks and some dogs, and we can take down anything. So we're wired for distributed cognition. So if, if, you know, if cognitive science is pointing towards anything, it's that. That was a very good question. Thank you. Uh, when you say that um, insight is reframing of a problem to fix it, yeah, does, does that involve in part um, looking at a situation in a different context than in the? What context What was the question? You would, you would initially look at. Can't it hear it. In? Yeah, the mic isn't picking up on the questions. Okay, I can guess. you repeat the question, please? please? When you say that uh, insight... Can you hear it now? No. You're still not hearing it. <laughs> Frank, can you hear me? It up. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. When you say that insight is the reframing of a problem to fix it, does that mean in part to look at a situation in a different context than the context you would initially look at the situation in? Well, kind of. I mean, the word context is, is we, think, we think we're sort of picking out something very clear and people throw it around a lot. But all context means is that which is around the text, right? It means things that you find relevant or basically what you're finding salient uh, around or surrounding some topic. So, I mean, is 
is is when I re when I do, redo the nine dot problem, is that a new context, or do I have to go to a different place 